Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Oh, we have an interesting program for you today. It's going to make you think and have fun and offer some promise while doing it. We've got two authors of new books, one whose name you know very well. We'll start with him in one moment. But later we are diving into the way China has captured Hollywood. This is fascinating. You know how like Hollywood movies these days seem boring and scrubbed and designed to only appeal to one subset of our population? There are really interesting reasons for that, and we're going to walk through it, uh, through them all. But my first guest today is a best-selling author, philanthropist, and all-around inspirational guy who everyone loves and people pay lots of money to go see because everyone just wants a piece of Tony Robbins' inspo, right? His His wisdom. Um, And he's written some of it down in a new book called Life Force, how new breakthroughs in precision medicine can transform the quality of your life and those you love. It's full of tips on how to increase energy, boost your immune system, and most importantly and interestingly, I think, turn back your biological clock. Yes, you want to live longer, but not if you can't live well. Well, he takes a hard look on at how that's possible and says the notion of what it means to be old or middle-aged is about to change dramatically, that 80 will soon be the new 50. Tony, thank you so much for being here. Nice to see you, Megan. I've been a fan of yours for years and years, all the way back to Fox time. So thanks for having me on. You're amazing. Uh, That's so nice to hear. Thank you so much. All right. So you are here to do something really important, which is help us not just live longer, but live better and become CEO of our own healthcare. Let's start with why this is important to you. Why did you write this book? You don't, you don't need the money. You don't have to be doing this. So why did you like, why'd you take on this cause? I'm also donating hundred percent as I've done my last three books. We're going to feed 20 million people through feeding America. I've been feeding. I committed to feed a hundred million people a year for, for 10 years to a billion people. In the last seven years, we're up to 850 million. So I'm really proud of it, but I wrote mm-hmm. it because there's a revolution that's happening right now in our medicine. There's something called precision medicine. And It's very different than anything we've seen before. It's being driven by technological changes. You know, most people know that technology basically doubles in its power about every 18 months and it halves in its cost. And we haven't seen that very often in healthcare, but it's happening right now by a group of scientists around the world. So I decided I want to interview 150 of the very best Nobel laureates, scientists, the best medical doctors. And none of the book is my opinion. It's bringing you exactly what they're showing in the areas like you said, increasing energy and strength, vitality. What are the basic things? Things you can do that don't take anything at all, just a couple of choices. What are some of the new tools and technology? And then if you're having a real challenge, if you've got something like cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, what are the best tools that are really available now? And I just wanted to bring it to people in a way that would be accessible because, you know, my billionaire friends know most of these things, but the average person doesn't have access. So I really just try to bring you access and then also do it in a form that would really move you emotionally. The head of the Cleveland Clinic interviewed me yesterday and he was saying, it's the best book that I've literally read. He said, I normally scan books. I read cover to cover. It's a large book. He said, but it also made me cry. So I've never had a book that <laughs> showed me the science and made me mm-hmm. cry because you'll be moved by the stories of the people who've created these breakthroughs, who've worked 20 or 30 years of their life. What they almost all have in common, Megan, is they lost a husband or a wife or a child and it pushed their brain to go beyond the standard of care and find new ways that can transform our lives. And it's just beautiful to see. It's so great. To your point, I uh, my doctor's in New York, but I need somebody. I've moved to Connecticut, so I need like a local guy. And um, I went to this office the other day, and they were there. It's like it's a concierge service, concierge medicine. It's an all cash business. I basically just needed one shot, so I didn't really have to get into it. But I was thinking, like, this is next level healthcare, but of course, it's only for rich people. And so your point sure. is, here's a book with all the information you would get from such a doctor and people w- well beyond such a doctor for everybody, for the average working Joe, and in particular on how to live well and, ha- and live longer and with more energy and better and better sex drive and all of it built yes. into these 800 some pages. All right. So let's talk about you because you had an injury that inspired you to sort of start taking a look at this. One, I think I can relate to a little bit. I didn't have as bad as you did. I had a roller blade injury. Um, it was roller derby, believe it or not, that I did for NBC. Are you kidding? No, but you had, you really hurt your shoulder your rotator cuff, and it kind of changed the way you thought the remainder of your life would go. It really did. I, I, I wanted to first say, though, that my desire to do this started much younger. When I was 
uh, 19 years old. I started when I was 17 at what I'm doing. So I've been doing it for 45 years. And I was obsessed with helping people and I worked extremely hard and I was had a lot of grace in my life. So I got access to some amazing athletes and I got great results and some CEOs. And then at 19, Megan, I found myself at a place, you know, that part of your brain that's kind of the fight or flight part, the kind of survival part. I didn't know how to manage that. I had a tough childhood. And so my brain suddenly started to say, well, maybe I'm in this position at this young age because I'm going to die young. I'm successful now because I'm going to die young. And even though intellectually I know that was insane, I even started having dreams about it, obsessing about it. And I thought it would be cancer, not some easy thing like hit by a car, walked away from cancer. Yeah. And the reason I tell you this is because it was a huge part in what made me later on be able to deal with the injuries I had because I, you know, I obsessing on it. And of course you obsess on something that shows up in your life usually. And fortunately, the first time it happened was not a tumor with me. It was my girlfriend and it was her mom. And she came home and said, they've sent her home to die. She's going to die in nine weeks. And even if it would have been me, Megan, I think, you know, I, I think most of us will do more for others we love than we'll do for ourselves. If it had been me, I'd probably have gone into fear. But instead, it's like, wait a second, there are thousands of people that have been in stage four cancer and turned it around in their life today. Let's go study those patterns. That's what I've done my whole life, right? So I would, you know, I'd taken a speed reading course. I started reading all these books and I found this book called One Answer to Cancer. It wouldn't be the one I recommend today because there's much better tools. But it was written by this dentist who had pancreatic cancer, the most deadly cancer of all. And 12 years later, he was alive and he explained what he did. So I went to this woman, her name was Jenny in her early 40s. And I said, Jenny, I said, I said, I think you could still live. This man lived. There are a lot of people. Why don't you read this and see if it's worth going for? I mean, you have no downside. If it doesn't work, you're just going to have the same outcome. Mm. And long story short, she applied it. And she had a tumor on the back of her shoulder that was protruding. And she had one in her feminine organs. And within two weeks, three weeks, she started having more energy and feeling better. In about 10 weeks, you couldn't see the tumor anymore. You couldn't feel it even. And so finally, when she outlived the time they thought she'd die, they did exploratory surgery and they found the end of my pinky's fingernail was all that was left of it. And the doctor said, this is just an absolute miracle. And she said, it is, but let me tell you what I did. And he's like, no, it's just a miracle. She's, by the way, in her 80s today, totally alive. And that changed me from victim and fear to really being kind of a biohacker and transforming my life. And so, you know, I do events for four days, seven days with 12, 15, 20,000 people in a stadium. And I hold them 12, 14 hours a day when they wouldn't sit for a three hour movie. So what I do with my body is insane. But what happened to me later is I got a tumor. Uh, I was actually, I went for, I'm a helicopter pilot as well. And I went for, uh, you know, a, a normal physical to stay qualified. You do it every two years. And the doc there did some blood tests. And so he kept calling and I was going to South of France. And I said, well, just tell him to send the report. And I come home one night, there's a note that says, call the doctor. He says it's an emergency. Oh, no. And then, you know, my old fear just went crazy. You know, the mind goes nuts. I've been so healthy for all this time, but I do fly. Is it too much radiation? You know what the mind does. Mm -hmm. And then, I, you know, I've learned to settle myself and say, like, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a courageous person once. Let me wake up in the morning and find out. Sure enough, doc tells me, you got a tumor in your brain. I'm like, what? I came to you. There was nothing wrong with me. He says, well, I noticed you had a lot of growth hormone. I said, well, how'd you figure that out? My hands are bigger than your head and my feet are size 16. I grew 10 inches in a year. I was 5'1 in high school. I'm 6'7 now. Oh. And he said, well, all I want to tell you is you have a pituitary tumor. You need to come in immediately for surgery. And when I asked the prognosis, he said, well, you know, I have to tell you, honestly, you can die. It's not an easy surgery, but you're not likely to. But your, you know, hormonal system will not be the same. And you probably have a lot less energy. And I was like, well, I'd love to get a second opinion. You know, I'd seen the Mayo Clinic studies, you know, saying everyone should get one. And so long story shortened, um, I went off trying to forget about this. And of course, the mind didn't let you do that. Came and did it, found out I had the tumor, and then decided to try a, a different approach, a biochemical approach. And I saw this top doctor in Boston, and he said, don't do the surgery. That's crazy. He said, you, you go to Switzerland twice a year, take this injection. I have something called gigantism. And he said, your heart valves won't get too big and you won't die. And I said, but my heart valves are normal. And he said, yes, they are. And I said, well, then why would I do this right now if I've had this for 10 years and I'm normal? He said, well, just to be certain. And I said, well, there's a price to certainty. Right? What if the drug has side effects? And which, by the way, this man was the sweetest man. He goes, you know, the baker wants to bake. The surgeon wants to cut. I want yeah. to drug you. He said, but you're right. You do have that option. So I went to six other doctors. The last one said to me, Tony, you recover from basically two marathons in a weekend like no one I've ever seen. And he said, you know, I know bodybuilders that pay $1,200 a month to get the growth hormone you have. So that was when I'm 32. I'm now 52 or 62, I should say. 
And in 30 mm -hmm. years, I monitor and I don't have a problem. So these things affected my psychology. So when I finally had this piece you described, being an idiot going down the side of a mountain <laughs> with chasing a 22-year-old professional snowboarder and discovering I didn't have that ability, uh, the wreck was pretty bad. I thought I broke my neck. It was so painful, but I Okay, but just for the record, process. not as dumb as roller derby, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Were you doing a story, Megan? Is that how you did Yes, it? I do have that as an excuse. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I can't imagine you just doing it for fun. <laughs> but I was doing it for fun, so I would still say idiotic. But th the bottom line is, I've lived with pain. Zero to ten, it was a nine-nine, Megan. I mean, like, mm. I couldn't sleep. The nerve pain was so bad. So you mm. go to your doctors, and I went to four. Surgery, surgery, surgery. And I always ask, what's the prognosis? Well, you know, you may not be able to lift your arm above your shoulder. Um, you know, it could tear again. How long does it take to rehab? Four to six months. So I'm, like, picturing me with one arm trying to do a seminar for 12 mm. hours a day. So I asked about stem cells because, as you know, I've worked with some of the greatest of all time in a variety of sports, great GOAT athletes, and some of them like Cristiano Ronaldo. He's supposed to have three months of recovery. It was two and a half weeks with stem cells. But all the docs said, no, they don't work. They won't make this happen. So I went to Dr. Peter Diamandis, who's a good friend of mine, rocket scientist and an MD from Harvard, and said, you know everybody, who should I talk to? And he said, Dr. Bob Harari, who's now a partner and a co-author in this book. He's one of the people that discovered stem cells. He said, Tony, at your age, your stem cells drop off the cliff. I was 53 at the time. He said, you need the force of life. You need to get stem cells that are brand new, like four days old. And I said, well, I don't want to do fetal tissue. He goes, well, we never do that. But when we have babies, you know, the placenta and the cord come out and most people throw them away. And we discovered it has the healing power like nothing else. So I went for three days of treatment. I had just an IV 20 minutes a day, a single injection. And I left out the most important part. The fourth doctor I talked to, after telling me about this problem with my shoulder, turned to me and said, literally looked at me in the face and said, now I need to be your doctor. I need to tell you life as you know it is over. I said, what? And he said, let me show you your spine. No more jumping, no more running, certainly no more snowboarding. He said, one hit and you could lose the ability to walk. And I was used to a lot of pain, but I wasn't used to that level. I came out of that and said, I got to find the solution. I went down to the stem cells. On day two, I woke up not only with no problem my shoulder, I have the MRI, my shoulder's perfect. No surgery, perfect shoulder. But the second thing that happened was I had no pain in my spine, Megan, for the first time in 14 years. So I became obsessed. I want to know everything about stem cells. And then I discovered it's not just stem cells. It's this regeneration revolution. And believe it or not, the Pope, and I'll finish with this, the Pope does every two years the biggest regenerative conference in the world because he sees this as a gift to humanity. And he brings all these doctors together and they asked me to be the cleanup speaker. And I said, I'm happy to do that, but I want to go to the whole program with all the other docs. And I did. And I met some of the most genius scientists in the world. I met people, at least two dozen people that were sent home to die, you know, because their cancers were untreatable, but they met Dr. June with CAR T cells, or they met a new approach and they're alive 10 years later. I met Jack Nicholas, who's, you know, the greatest golfer of all time. He was told he was in so much pain. He couldn't stand for 10 minutes, literally without the pain being unbearable. Here's a guy his whole life, athletic, playing golf and missed all that. They were going to fuse his spine, which only works about half the time. Thank God he didn't do that. He did stem cells and he's now 82 years old playing golf and playing tennis again. So wow. that gave me the drive to say, I'm going to interview these 150 doctors. I want to bring those answers to people. And I have this healing in my own body as a secondary gift as well. Oh, now, wait a minute, because, you know, when you give birth to a baby, they give you the option of um, sending you know. sending all that off to be stored just in case your kid needs some life saving thing, which I did. But would I need to use that or I can just get stem cells from, you know, any doctor? Does it have to be something that came from me? No, it doesn't. That's called autologous. That's the legal term for what comes from you. And at this stage of life, that probably, unless you have like a small change, like an elbow or maybe a little bit to a knee, but for something greater, you need what's called allergenic. It's just a fancy word from cells from someone else, but it's still valuable. You know, I met an 11 year old child that was supposed to die when he was four and they use his sister stem cells because they forgot to, or didn't believe in, you know, saving the, the cord. And Dr. Bob Harari is by the way, who's the first person who ever did that. He's the one who created the original companies that do that. I did that. Mm -hmm. I just now have a 10 month old daughter. I have a 48 year old and a 10 year old, I have five kids and five grandkids, <laughs> but I saved it for the same reason. But today, they can take even skin cells and turn into something called pluripotent, which means cells that can become anything else in your body, any organ. So there are a lot more choices, but I still recommend for parents to save that because the match is so precise. It's still incredibly valuable.
Mm -hmm. So the, it's not just the stem cells. I mean, that I'm sure it sounds Correct. like it really helped you. But there's another effect, effect that you write about in the book involving the placebo effect, which was fascinating yes. to me. So I wonder, I mean, do you and we'll get in. I want you to explain it. But do you think that the, it was indeed the stem cells that helped you? Or do you think there was some element of just the power of positive thinking and believing that they would help you? I'm a very positive person. I was using every <laughs> positive approach I could and trying multiple other approaches and they didn't make it happen. Now, the stem cells both take down your inflammation, but they also send the signals to your body. They have the original signals that you're made from. There's actually a company that has something different. It's called, um, well, uh, I think you know, your audience may not, that the FDA goes through three phases of approval on something. And stem cells have been approved, a million people have used them. But there's a brand new company that if you have osteoarthritis, for example, when you and I are born, we have fetal tissue. But after that, there's something called the WINT pathway, WNT pathway. And it's a signaling system that tells the stem cells what to become, become brain cells, become this many heart cells and so forth. Well, this company has created this breakthrough of being able to accelerate that natural process in your body. And they are in the third phase, which means they think they'll be approved if, they're, if it goes through in the last part of this year, or the beginning of next year, where you could eliminate osteoarthritis, which affects millions of people, single injection, and it stimulates your own wind pathway to make your own stem cells, and you regrow your own tendons over 11 months. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, wow. and, but the tendons you get, if you understand a little bit about your genome, it's, it's like Dolly the sheep, and then you make a brand new sheep when they did that. Well, mm -hmm. they, the new genome allows you to have like 16-year-old tendons, even if you're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. So these things are happening everywhere. But I don't think it was just the mind uh, based on what I've seen. And I'm a big believer in the mind, as I think you know. Yeah, exactly. But there are limits to even what Tony Robbins can do with his mind. So that's, <laughs> that doesn't bode well for the rest of us. Um, all right. So wait, we're, I'm going to squeeze in a quick break, but I want to I want to get to the placebo effect. And I want to talk about the three things that you say everybody needs to focus on to, to improve their lives. And we'll walk through how they can do that. More with Tony Robbins after this very quick break on the secrets to living longer and better. Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and our dear friends at Genucel have a special treat that you will love with all your heart. From now till Valentine's Day, get the brand new Genucel Anti-Aging Primer for a radiant glow and flawless finish free with every order of Genucel's most popular package. Using the same goodness that we all love, Genucel's new primer contains botanical extracts and antioxidants to deeply hydrate, brighten, and complete your finished look. Don't take my word for it, though. Here's a five-star review from Soretta in Tacoma, Washington. She writes, this primer's amazing. I put it on my skin when it's dry. It gives such an airbrushed look. It makes me not even want to apply anything else. I love that my face glows right through my foundation. In love. Ladies, treat yourself. And guys, this is not skin care. It's a gift of luxury for that special lady in your life. Visit lovegenucel.com slash MK60 and enter my special promo code MK60 for an extra discount at checkout. That's lovegenucel.com slash MK60, lovegenucel.com slash MK60. Welcome back to The Megyn Kelly Show. Here with me today, best-selling author, Tony Robbins. His new book is Life Force, how new breakthroughs in precision medicine can transform the quality of your life and those you love. So Tony, what is the placebo effect? And talk to us about some of these studies that have looked at, at it, because it's real. The one involving the veterans was just stunning, and the surgery they were doing, I think, Isn't on it? knees... Yes, it's amazing. Well, first of all, most people don't realize the power of the mind to make you sick or to make you well. And in World War II, a surgeon who was very famous was trying to help people and they're bleeding out. And so they needed morphine. Morphine keeps them from going to shock besides lowering the pain. And they ran out of morphine. And a nurse actually is really responsible for this because the doctor was freaking out. And she said, oh, I found some more. And I don't know why she did it, but she just gave him saline and he thought it was an injection of morphine. So he had the total belief and told the patient, you'll be out of pain in a couple minutes or less. You're going to be fine. And he did it with each of them. Well, none of them went into shock and 90% of them, the pain disappeared with no drugs being applied. And so when he went back to school after World War II to Harvard, he was the first person that started to make these studies that we basically do now. We compare drugs to a placebo, an inert substance to see their value. What a lot of people don't know is oftentimes a placebo is more powerful than the drug, but you don't make billions of dollars sharing that information. And as you noted, 
placebos are affected by your level of certainty that something's going to happen. It's like our brain can heal itself. And so if we give you a small pill, you get a bigger reaction. If I give you a big pill, if I give you a shot, even bigger reaction in terms of healing and speed. And the one that's most powerful, Megan, you just alluded to is what some people call a sham surgery, but it's a placebo surgery. So the Veterans Administration decided with arteriosclerosis or not arteriosclerosis with our uh, knee, knee pain or knee challenges that they would do a third of the people where they would cut them open and do nothing and just sew them back up. So they would think they had the surgery. And a year later, the Veterans Administration stopped funding those types of surgeries because a year later, to a man and to a woman, the people who had no surgery claimed they had no pain, that they had extraordinary flexibility versus the ones who had the surgery, large numbers of them still had pain and challenges. So literally that changed. But it's even more powerful than that, Megan. There, uh, Harvard did a study where they didn't use placebos. They used real drugs. So they handed somebody a large red pull, pill and said, this is an amphetamine. Your body's going to speed up. You should be prepared for it. And they actually gave them a barbiturate, which would slow you through the floor. Wow. Every person exploded through the roof as if they'd given an amphetamine. And then they reversed it with a blue pill and did the other piece. It sounds like a, a movie, but they yeah. do this. Uh, Dr. Langer, who's kind of the one of the co-founders of mindfulness at Harvard, is a friend of mine, and she's done these studies where you see changes like they go to people and take a group of people in their 70s and take them off for two weeks on this little journey to the Catskills. And they inform them everything is from 35 years earlier, the imagery, the television shows, everything. And they inform them talking first person as if it was 35 years later or earlier. What's amazing is after two weeks of this experience, they measured all their vitals before and afterwards. And the first thing that happens, their eyesight improved. The second thing that improved is blood pressure dropped massively from the high blood pressure most of them did. Blood sugars balanced and they looked younger. And there are all these studies also about how we make ourselves sick with our mind. I had the privilege of meeting a man named Norman Cousins. Probably not many people know his name now, but he was really one of the fathers of psychoneuroimmunology, which is the study of how your brain psycho affects your immune system. And he was diagnosed with a deadly disease. And for whatever reason, he did not want to use the drugs that were available. They had large side effects. And he decided that he thought his immune system would be stimulated if he wasn't in pain. And the way out of pain was to laugh. And so he would go spend, when he had this pain, two, three hours watching these old, silly movies and laugh his guts out. And ironically, what happened, science has now shown it, is he cured himself of the disease, he got out of the pain, but most importantly, he wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness, which kind of launched this form of study around the world. There are buildings dedicated to him at UCLA now. But this man told me, I interviewed him when I was 24, there were no podcasts, then I had this cassette tape program that I used to share with people, I'd interview people. And he told me a story, he says, Tony, not only can we make ourselves healthy, but make ourselves sick, but we can make our own fears viral to affect other people's health. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'll give you an example. He said, you know how you yawn and he said, don't yawn. Somebody, you find yourself yawning or somebody's laughing hysterically. It's not that funny, but they're having such a good time. You find yourself laughing. That's viral. It's psychological viral. He said, I went to a, a game, a college football game. And he said, here's what happened. He said, a person got really sick and were literally projectile vomiting and they're in the stand. So people are kind of trying to get out of the way. They call the doctor. The doctor is trying to diagnose what happened, trying to find out what's different in this man's regimen. What did he, was it food poisoning? And he found out he had drank and he'd gone to the vending machine and drank a Coca-Cola. And so the doc just thinking, well, that's the only thing that's different. Maybe the, the thing is poisonous. Maybe there's some kind of chemicals that have gotten into it. So they made an announcement over the airwaves in the middle of halftime oh, to everyone boy. to avoid the vending machines because they may be poisonous. Well, he said, Tony, it was <laughs> it was like a movie. He said projectile vomiting started happening within oh. five to 20 minutes all over the place. Twelve ambulances going to two different hospitals, what? taking people, shuttling people back and forth. An hour and a half later, they did tests and found out there was nothing wrong with the vending machine. And they told everybody and everybody got well. And so I'll give you the last piece, the CDC. When I put this in, everything in my book is documented. It's not even, it's my opinion again, but it sounds ridiculous. The CDC, you know, what are people most scared about right now? COVID-19 and dying of it. Now, the number one factor obviously is age, somebody in their 80s, because their immune system is often suppressed at that stage. But outside that, the number one factor most people know today is obesity, something we can actually do something about. 79.8, call it 80% of the people that have died are obese. There's all kinds of comorbidities that come with that that make your body weaken. But you know what number two is? According to the CDC, 
I fear did, I anxiety read it in your book. is the number two thing that will <laughs> cause you to die. Because when you're afraid, you shut down your immune system. When you're afraid, it changes your heart rate, can make an irregular heart rate. It changes your breathing. It changes your oxygenization. So unfortunately, in our media and media people, you know, they're doing their best job they can. They're not trying to harm you. They're trying to inform people. But we all know if it bleeds, it leads. And so, you know, the death rates constantly in front of you has created so much fear. And that is, according to CDC, a factor that we want to avoid at all costs. Oh, yeah. The cable news model, and actually I can say you know, firsthand, broadcast as well, is to upset you. That's that's what will get you to tune in, either anger you or upset you. And, you know, it's funny, Tony, because I'm listening to you talk. My mom's mom died at almost 101. and. Wow. um Wait, she was 101. Yeah, she was 101. Anyway, she wow. um, she was overweight. She never exercised a day in her life. She ate terribly, <laughs> only processed food. I mean, only processed food, nothing f- fresh or healthy. And I was thinking about it, and she was kind of stressed out for part, parts of her life. So I'm like, well, I don't get it. But you know what? She laughed. She was funny. And she she was quick to laugh, and she was quick to make others laugh. And I'm listening to you thinking, I finally get it. <laughs> well, I, I interviewed a woman named Alice Summers. Was the, at this time she was the oldest living survivor of the Holocaust. I think she was 108 at the time I interviewed her. Oh. Living on her own, Megan, um, swimming every day, playing the piano. This is a woman who was a, a very famous pianist in Europe. And during World War II, when Hitler, she was Jewish, took her family, killed everybody except her son, and used her son as the hostage to say you are going to perform for us because they made these films, the Nazis did, to try and make it look like they were treating, you know, Jews well. And we're going to kill your son in front of you if you don't look healthy, if you don't look happy, and if you don't play well. So imagine going through all of that and then surviving the Holocaust. And by the way, the music was the escape for not only her, but all the people listening, you know, in the camp. Mm. They talked about it. And the people in her apartment still listened to her play the piano. But she went through all those things and everything was beautiful to her. She, the, the microphone was beautiful. I was beautiful. My wife was beautiful. What we're uh-huh. talking about is beautiful. And I really believe that it's a giant part biochemically of what makes somebody be able to manage through all the stresses we have. Because we're all going to have extreme stress. We're all going to have but times. You, I don't you, care. But you know there are people sitting there right or, now listening to this who don't have the power of positive thinking like a Tony Robbins. And they're like, I can't. I'm genuinely stressed out. I know I shouldn't be stressed out. It's like, you know, I've been told I have cancer and you want me to not be stressed. And I'm more stressed than ever. And I can't de stress because no matter what I try to tell myself, I know the cancer is still there. That's what's stressing me. Yeah. Well, I still have the tumor inside my head as well. Um, but I understand some are more yeah. compelling or more scary than others. So I'm not suggesting that's an easy thing to do. Wow. But there are, you know, I, one of the things I was always, you know, I felt I could help anyone in any situation. But tell you honestly, the one place I didn't feel I could, it was somebody who was terminal. I think it's probably because I had my own sense yeah. of not wanting to die or my own handled that within myself. So I went to, and I interviewed the professors at UCLA, Tony Atala also, a whole group yeah. of from NYU yeah. who are doing research now. So and they use for people that are in a place where they're terminal, um, they use uh, the equivalent of magic mushrooms, the sure. ingredient magic mushrooms. And they've done these studies. And I said, you know, well, when people get addicted or something. They said, no, it's a one time okay. session. And they don't know which one it's going to be because it's done properly. And he said, Tony, they showed me a video of this woman. He goes, this woman, before I show it to you, she, to give you a sense of this woman, she's not a California atheist. She's a New York atheist. Mm-hmm. California <laughs> atheist might say God might be in the trees or something. But she's like, there is no God. There's never been a God. It's all BS. And she's really angry and scared. And then you see her afterwards. And she says, I experienced God for the first time. And and. 92% of the people lose their fear. So I want an audience that is in that position to know that there are solutions and they're not ongoing medication. That's what a drug is. It's a one-time experience that resets the nervous system. There's actually, a, for people with PTSD, uh, you know, I've worked with 22 veterans, kill themselves every day. It's, it's one of the saddest things in our world, in my opinion. And I've worked with guys, I worked with a gentleman that had gone on, uh, lost 42 of his buddies, been in both Iraq and Afghanistan, came to one of my programs with dark glasses because light would set him off, night sweats. I mean, anything you can imagine. He was holding a microphone that was shaking like this. And, you know, I've got a lot of tools. It took me about two hours, turn him around. I actually took him on CNN. The producer cried when she saw him because she saw him before and then saw him two months afterwards. But if I worked 24 hours a day, I couldn't support all the veterans. So I was looking for a scalable solution. And there is one right now. The Army has done a study on this new injection it's done to calm the part of your system that keeps you in this hyper vigilant state. 
And so if you're really adrenalized and when people come back, so I sponsored a hundred vets and I'll just give you one example, how powerful it is. It works 85% of the time. I, the first vet ever wrote me and I don't know these people. I just wanted to help and wrote me. They knew I've sponsored it and said, just want to thank you. And the person described what they'd been through and described how when they came home, they couldn't be around their children or wife. That they were either, everything was black and white or they were enraged. Those only two gears they had and that they tried to kill themselves twice. And after the first shot, 20 minutes afterwards, that's called the sympathetic nervous system, the part that makes you go, go, go like crazy versus yeah. parasympathetic, which is what allows you to relax and heal. And a person said, wrote to me, he said, I see colors for the first time. I went home and hugged my wife and children for the first time. I have no fear of the future. I still have the memories, but I have none of the pain associated with those memories. And, and so I have that described in the book as well. And, and by the way, this person, that was three years ago. He's now helped me. He's helped, I think, four other people with a very similar response. So there are solutions when the fear is that extreme mm -hmm. that are available to people where it's not just positive thinking. And by the way, I don't really believe in just positive thinking. I believe in intelligence. I don't think you should go to your garden and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. <laughs> I believe you should see the weeds and pull them out and be proactive <laughs> towards the solution. I'm not into rah-rah. I, I certainly believe in energy and enthusiasm because that one makes us feel alive. And when you have more energy, you tend to take action as opposed to just be afraid and do nothing. Well, what about that energy? I mean, because everyone would like to have a little bit more energy and just feel a little bit more youthful, a little bit more vibrant. How do we go after that? Is it just, I mean, is there some sort of stem cell cocktail for those of us who just want to pick me up? <laughs> I, I, and speaking of which, I said to my same doctor in New York, what do you got? I'm in the market for an upper. I need something. And he said, you're over 50, you got three kids and you work full time. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, li I like his attitude <laughs> but you know also the concierge doctor just means you get to the front of the line it doesn't mean that you get the most unique in front health care because yeah. you have to get to a regenerative doctor to do that so uh, oh. just so you know there's a little difference there but i will tell you there's okay. all kinds of things you can do naturally uh, let me tell you the natural one first it's so simple i mean basic ones like i sleep I, my thing has yeah. always been I'll sleep when I die. I was actually working on that chapter at 6.15 in the morning. I had to be up at 9.30 for a meeting. And I was like, what's wrong with this picture? But then, you know, I met Dr. Walker, who's a neuroscientist at UC Berkeley. He's kind of like the sleep Google doctor. And he convinced me to change my pattern. My wife lives eight hours and just loves it. Come to bed. Oh, well, I'll be there soon, you know. But I've changed my pattern and I see a giant difference in the energy. And the reason he convinced me is he said there's this study done on 1.6 billion people in the world on sleep. And I said, you couldn't have coordinated. What are you talking about? He said, Tony, I didn't have to. He said, it's daylight savings time in mm -hmm. 70 countries. And all we had to do is look at the stats. And this is crazy. Wild. I remember this from your book. Yeah, tell us. Yeah, when you, when we, when we, you know, have spring forward and you lose an hour, just one hour of sleep compared to what you're normally used to, on average in all 70 countries for the next three days, heart attacks go up 24% like clockwork. When we fall back and just get one more hour of sleep, right, 21% decrease in heart attacks. And then he also shows you accidents and everything else. He also showed me that a man like me that sleeps four to five hours a night usually has testosterone levels that of a man 10 years older. If a woman mm -hmm. in, a, in a family feels like, God, I don't feel intimacy, sleep is one of the first categories. But then there's the high tech pieces that are mind boggling that are coming. So I'd love to share that with you. Yeah, um, yeah. And let, let me just tell you, there's a guy named Dr. You know, David Sinclair. He's one of the greatest longevity experts in the world from Harvard. He's become a good friend. And he took his himself and he's 53 years old, you know, chronologically, but he's 33 years old biochemically. We don't, our body doesn't all age at the same level. And he does these forms of triggers to the body using natural substances that literally moves the body, slows the aging process. And he's beginning to show that it actually can begin to reverse it for the first time. That used to sound like, you know, science fiction. Uh, he's done it with animals and he's now doing it with humans. His father is 80 years old. When he was 72, he couldn't walk anymore. Now he not only walks two miles a day, he outlifts David in the gym. His cognitive capacity has gone through the roof. Now, how's this happen? Well, one, I'd love to give your audience an um, education without being too technical. So let's just think of it this way. We all know our DNA. Your DNA is not your destiny. Uh, your DNA is instructions from your mom and dad, 3.2 billion of each. They're these letters and they form genes and so forth. And what's interesting though, is which genes get turned on or off is what determines your destiny. And that's called your epigenome. Your epigenome, epi means above. And the epigenome can be affected by your diet, your sleep, your exercise, radiation, chemicals, and so forth. But here's the really cool breakthrough they found. 
There are seven master genes. They're called sirtuins. You don't have to remember the name. It's in the book if you want it. But these seven master genes do two competing things that are critical for your life and energy. First, they get the epigenome to turn on or off certain genes. It will determine how quickly you age, how well you deal with poisons or toxins in your body, etc. Second, it reduces inflammation, which is the basis of a lot of disease. Mm -hmm. And third, the energy of your body is called mitochondria. It's in every cell of your body. And it stokes those mitochondria. It provides the conversion of food so we have energy. If you're really efficient there, you have a lot of energy. If you're not, the energy is lower. COVID steals from that energy in your mitochondria, for example. So these sirtuins also do a separate competing task. As we age, by exposure to radiation, bad foods, lifestyle, etc., our DNA starts to break down and get corrupted. These master genes, sirtuins, go in and clean that up for you. But when you, they need a fuel. So one more word, okay, NAD. This is a, a natural substance in your body that your body makes, and it makes these sirtuins have the fuel they need. Well, when you turn towards the end of your 40s to early 50s, these NAD drops off the cliff. So there's no fuel. So now the sirtuins have to decide, am I gonna clean up your DNA and make you great? Or am I gonna give you energy or inflammation? And so that split focus, imagine like you had a mansion and you had this great staff and they're young. In the beginning, anything breaks down, they fix it. Everything looks perfect, but they get older and older and a little senile and all of a sudden you don't have the raw materials and now your mansion's gone, that's aging. So there's one more factor. Those factors that NAD only becomes possible by a precursor. And I'm sorry for all the language, but NMN, like never mother never, is something your body creates, but it also drops off the cliff. So you can supplement it. And that's what David does. And that's why 53 versus 33. That's why his dad's doing Like when you say supplement, a pill or what? Yes, it's a pill now. But here's the challenge. We went, uh, David's office did it. I was with them. They checked out seven of these on on the market. Some sell for like $30, some $120 a month. Not one had any NMN in it. I said, how's this? Ask the lab guy. How's this possible? Are they all cheating? It all comes from China. And he goes, well, some people do cheat. But he said, more likely, it's taking so long to get here to your door, it breaks down in 30 to 45 days. So mm. David has a special in that holds up well. But here's the most exciting thing. In the book, I show you what you can do right now and then what's coming short term, 12 to 36 months. So you know and you're prepared for it and you can take advantage of it. There's Very a company called My, uh, Metro Biotech, and they have created a new form of NMN that does not break down. It's crystallized, but it's better than that. So let me give you two examples. They, if they give this NMN to an old mouse, uh, the equivalent of a 70 year old person is a 20, 24 month old mouse. An old mouse can go a quarter of a kilometer without going into exhaustion. A young, strong mouse can go four times that, a full kilometer. When they give 14 days of this NMN to an old mouse, it runs after that two to three kilometers, 200 to 300 times as much as the strongest what? mouse. And you might say, well, Tony, that's interesting, but does that transfer to humans? That was my question. Well, we got the answer. The Daily Mail (laughs) got a scoop and also in Boston for two years, they've been working top secret with our special forces, with our military. And the commander, they just finished the two year study and the commander got so excited, he kind of blurted it out somehow to somebody in the news. And so they know some of it. I know more. I invested in the company because I wanted first access to this for me and for my family. But here's what's really fascinating. Here's what the commander said. I can tell you that. He said that the results they had gotten previously with mice, they're seeing in the strongest, fittest people in the world. So these are people that are already fit. There's not much room to improve. He said their endurance has exploded through the roof. Their strength has increased from the same stimulus, same exercises. And most importantly for special forces is you get exhausted. Can you keep your cognitive ability together? And their cognitive scores have gone through the roof. So now there's a phase three trial on COVID that's going on in the hospital right now for prevention and for long-term COVID because it steals some mitochondria, right? It affects you. And there's one for kidneys because it's another challenge with COVID. And then there's all these ones for performance. I, one of the gentlemen who's the founder of this company introduced me a friend of his who's, he was 60 when he stopped playing competitive chess because he just cognitively couldn't do it. And your brain needs more energy than anything else. Well, this provides that at a cellular level, including in your brain. He's now 72 playing world-class competitive chess. So 
there's some pretty exciting things that are coming as well as the things that you can do and, right and now. you're saying soon you so you use the term 12 months p- potentially like we could get this at the store within a year potentially this would be this would be 18 to 24 months for this one where they are in the fda process for this one the one i told you about growing your tendons that's the one that we think they'll have by the end of the year or the beginning of next year but it won't be a nutraceutical They'll break down. This is being approved by the FDA. So you'd go to your doctor, your doctor there, and he could provide it for you. But you then be cleaning up your DNA at the time you need it most because, you know, when you're 20, you don't have as much exposure. By the time you're 50 or 60, you've accumulated a lot more and you're getting more energy and you're reducing inflammation and you're turning on and off the right genes. So it's it's one of the greatest breakthroughs that's coming forward that also is not invasive. It's not a surgery. It's nothing of that crazy wow. thing. You're not putting something in your body. This is reminding me of, um, I was getting this, there's this laser that I liked called Skin Tight. It didn't do anything other than just like heat through your skin uh, <laughs> to stimulate collagen. And if you had five treatments, it was supposed to take off like five years or something like that. And I was telling my husband, yeah. Doug, and uh, he goes, well, how, how many treatments are you planning on getting? Because if you go back too far, this relationship's going to start to feel inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like your husband already. <laughs> He's a awesome. good man. All right, let Sounds me pause like it there. Sounds like laughing. I'll pay a bill. We'll come back and we'll do much, much more on how you can live well. And what about the sex drive? Let's get to it. Uh, Stand by. More with Tony Robbins right after this. And don't forget, folks, you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east. And the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. If you prefer an audio podcast, subscribe and download on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you leave me a comment on the Apple comments, I will read it. I read them in the mornings. I read today's. I read every single one. There's over 22,000. And that's how I hear back from you guys. And it also helps our show. So it works both ways. Uh, And by the way, you'll find our full archives there with more than 250 shows, which I think you'll find fascinating. You know I'm always looking out for you, especially when it comes to exposing the hypocrisy of the elites. Like the fact that 52 members of Congress violated insider trading rules in 2021. Ugh. Well, there's another exclusive market where the ultra-rich trade more than $60 billion a year. And that is the art market. In fact, blue-chip art prices outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. That's why I'm so excited to tell you about an investing platform called Masterworks, finally giving regular folks access to this asset class at a price point most people can afford. Early investors already saw over 30% annualized rate of return in 2020 and 2021 from the sale of two paintings. Log on to masterworks.art slash MK to get started. That's masterworks.art slash MK. See important disclaimers at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. All right, so can we talk about peptides? Because I don't know anything about peptides, but I'm looking at this book. I'm yes. looking at the list of stuff it can do for me. Reduce appetite, promote fat loss, strengthen immune system, boost sexual arousal and satisfaction, heal the gut, increase muscle mass, revive skin and restore. I'll do it. Uh, what is it? How do I get it? Well, first of all, these are not some new thing. They were made in the 1960s in Russia. Uh, They were trying to figure out what to do. They're trying to compete with America with nuclear submarines, and these sailors are dropping like flies. And so a gentleman there who became very famous discovered these small chain amino acids can change how your body responds. And he healed the sailors, but then he also was responsible for a lot of the athletes during the Olympic time. But there's one, there's a whole list in them here. So there's one, for example, called PT-141. Yeah, these are hard to remember, but I have a chart in the book so you can decide what am I interested in. You can talk to your doctor or you can talk to a telemedicine doctor we recommend who you can listen to. We do it as well. But what's really interesting is, you know, men have, for example, blue pills because it's a blood flow challenge in most cases. But for women, it's not usually a blood flow challenge. It's the desire itself. The women are taking on so many things, thinking about all the people they care about and all the management and their brains work differently. So this actually has been proven. It stimulates that desire. Men use it as well. Uh, but it's pretty extraordinary. And there's some for healing the body. There, there's so many different ones, and it's, it's a science within itself. Hmm. But I'd like, I know we're going to run out of time, if I may. There's one thing I'd love to make sure, because I, I really want people to know about. Yeah. You know, the big fears that people have, there's all these great things you can enhance with. But cancer and heart disease are the two big killers. Yep. And I just want people to know that in the past, you know, getting a diagnosis, going to your doctor and having them tap on your knee and maybe do a blood test doesn't sound like very much. But today, there's new tech. 
And so, for example, everybody in the book who's a hero, you go on the journey with them, their stories, and they broke through because somebody, like I said, died in their family and they just were pushed to another level. One of those created a cancer breakthrough people need to know about. Uh, the Cancer Society described something really interesting, a study of 100,000 people, and they found that if you're at stage three or four when they find the cancer, you have an 80% chance of dying. I prefer the 20% chance of living and focusing on that, but their point is it's really hard to turn it around. If you're at stage one or two, you have an 80 to 99.9% .9 chance of living. It might even an outpatient situation. But most of the cancers that get us are not mammograms. It's not, we don't have tests for them. So this gentleman lost his wife, who's from Google, is very wealthy. And he put together this project called Grail. And it's just come out in the last four or five months. And it can do a simple blood test and find 50 different cancers, even before they're showing up in your body. And this is so important. We had a gentleman that came to one of our Fountain Life Centers. His wife pushed him to go. And he said, I've already had my physical. And they did my blood and your analysis. And we did the Grail test with him. And sure enough, he had kidney cancer. But it was just the beginning of it. And so guess what? It was an outpatient process that took 20 minutes and he's free of cancer. Wow. So you got to know there, along with MRI, there are these tools that are priceless today. You want to catch it when it's young. And then the other one I just want people to know about is heart disease kills number one for both men and women. And traditionally, maybe if you've got a CT scan, it's hard to tell what's going on. They're trying to see, have you built up plaque that's going to cause a heart attack or a stroke? And it's really hard to read. And sometimes there's false surgeries even. There are problems with it. There's a brand new tool. Again, last six months came out. It's called a CCTA test. And it has an AI, artificial intelligence, that digitally opens your arteries, goes through and says, is this calcified? Because if it's calcified, it means it's hardened. It means you've actually healed. You're not going to have a heart attack. Or is this something that can break off its soft plaque and it can cause you to have a heart attack? They can predict a heart attack five years in advance, Megan, and they can show you what to do. So I'll just give you an example. My partner's called me up, so you got to do this test. And my father-in-law's with me and he's just turned 80. And he's a really beautiful man and he, you know, he was in the lumber business. But you know, when people get older, people start saying, hey, you got to get ready, prepare for, you know, the, the, the inevitable. And you see him lose that edge. So I said, dad, I'm going to go do this test. We're both at a stage of life. We're going to have some soft, you know, plaque there, but they'll tell us exactly where it is and what we can do to clean it up. And so he came. My father does this test and he has nothing wrong. It's all calcified. He is completely healthy as can be. His entire mindset changed. I was better than five years ago, but he was better than me. And then you, know, you have this hip problem and there are these tools now. I had it done to my ankle where they can scan your body now with ultrasound, see where the problem is open up the tissue with amnio fluid and release a nerve or release what's stopping you. And so my ankle's perfect. So my father said, I said, well, as long as you're here, why don't you see these guys? Well, they spent 30 minutes with him and now his hip's perfect. So now, you know, what makes you old? Feeling pain, feeling like can't do things. Yes. He's walking perfectly. His heart's perfect. So he gets on the plane with me. I'll never forget this. He his arms. He says, you know, Tony, those people that talk about living to 110, 120, I don't know if I buy that, but my heart's perfect. You know, I'm walking perfect. I could live another 20 years. I could live to 100. You've only been married to my wife, to my daughter 22 years. That's like another lifetime. And he's completely transformed. So this doesn't have to be the negative that people think about. With technology today, the breakthroughs are extraordinary. And, and by the way, if you're concerned about cancer, go get yourself some broccoli sprouts just to plant a little seed with you. There are thousands of studies and for breast cancer specifically it reduces 80% of cancer for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. There's some little things you can do, but you got to know where you are and then figure out where you want to go. And then you can navigate that whether you want performance or great energy, or you're trying to avoid some kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. I will, I'll steal the last word because one thing you mentioned uh, or recommend in the book is something that I believe in too, which is get yourself, if you're 50 or older, a bone density test. It's really just an x-ray. It's like an x-ray of your wrist. It's such a non, it's a nothing. And it can tell you whether you are going into osteoporosis or whatever. And they have these amazing meds now, or if you, they, you basically get a shot and you can get your bones back to youthful strength. I mean, it's crazy. So much is reversible now in terms of the really aging is. process so it's and like for women as you know that's critical in their 50s really critical there's also something called osteo strong which is a 10 minute exercise a week at a local place that has been shown to produce the strongest changes in bone density and you can wear your clothes and do it it takes literally 10 minutes a lot of athletes do it because your muscles are limited to your bone strength so it's not so just wait. people breaking down that are doing this 
so it's it's the best 800 pages you will ever read in your life. It could literally. <laughs> I think it's only add, 700. Don't don't scare okay. them. <laughs> I include the the index. It, it can literally add quality years to your life. Why wouldn't you check it out? Life Force, and as it, Tony points out, all the profits go to help feed people in need. What a pleasure, Tony Robbins. Thank you so much. Please come back. I will. Thank you so much, Megan. Take good care of yourself. Lots of love. You too. Uh, Coming up next, we're going to take a deep dive into Hollywood's deep, weird, and destructive relationship with China. Look, we're all adults here, and I know some people choose to use nicotine to relax or focus or just unwind after a long day. Lucy is a modern oral nicotine company that makes nicotine gum, lozenges, and pouches for adults who are looking for the best, most responsible way to consume their nicotine. Lucy was created by an ex-smoker who knew there had to be a better option, right? Their scientists used innovations in chemistry and flavor science to create an alternative that actually tastes and feels great. It's a new year. Why not start it out by switching to a new nicotine product that you can feel good about? If you enjoy using nicotine, you should definitely check out Lucy's products at lucy.co. That's lucy.co and use the promo code MK at checkout. Also, I have to read this disclaimer for you. Warning, this product contains nicotine. You gathered that from when I said it's a nicotine product, (laughs) but it does contain nicotine and nicotine is an addictive chemical. Remember, if you're interested in a better way to use nicotine, visit lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code MK. Welcome back to The Megyn Kelly Show. This is so interesting. It explains so much. My next guest is Eric Schwartzel. He's a reporter who started covering Hollywood over a decade ago. Right away, he noticed something weird. Everywhere he looked, he saw the presence of China, the influence of China. Why? How did that happen? What's going on? He says it was eye-opening to see a foreign country so blatantly using our film industry to spread its values abroad, in casting, in financial deals, in marketing, in box office tallies, and so on. And he's got a new book out of, out that explains it so well. It's called Red Carpet. Nice. I like that. See the play on words? Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the global battle for cultural supremacy. Eric, thank you for being here. Megan, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, I didn't think you're so good at explaining this. I mean, I've listened to you on some podcasts and I the book is just so educational. Um, so you kind of break it down in a way that's very easy to understand. And as I see it, you know, you talk about first sort of acts, your first act, second act of the book. In the first act, you've got China opening up to American movies. Hey, maybe we'll show some American movies in China. This is interesting. OK, we'll do that. Then there comes mm, China becomes our student. China says, would you teach us how to make the movies? This is actually a really cool industry. You know, like we'll be the little tutor and you be or mentee and you be the mentor, American Hollywood people. And uh, we'll learn from you. This is so interesting. And then suddenly, you know, that's that's happening and it moves on to China begins its own movie industry. And now is at the phase of that's booming. And now they're trying to export their values to us. And not just that, but the central theme of the book is not only they're exporting their values to us and their movies, but they have effectively kidnapped the Hollywood filmmakers into not offending the Chinese, self-censoring, explicitly censoring to, pr- to please the Chinese, not just in the movies that they're going to release over in China, but even the ones they're going to release here. And it has to do with way more than just ticket sales. It has to do with large international relationships that are very big business. And boy, oh boy, Hollywood has surrendered. It explains so much. Anyway, so you've studied it all. Let's let's walk through it because it's a fascinating story. Let's start back. And it was uh, what you said, like the 90s, I think, when when they first were like, oh, gee, Hollywood's fun. Maybe maybe, you know, we will start showing American movies in China. Exactly. And, and Hollywood wasn't the only Western industry moving into China at the time, China's economy was modernizing rapidly. And this is when we started to see the real rise of the Chinese middle class. So Hollywood kind of frankly followed behind aerospace, auto, tech, a lot of American sectors that were moving into China. And at the time, 
despite having this massive population, China had very, very few movie theaters. And so the box office was really something of an afterthought. There really wasn't a lot of money to be made there. But that started to change in the early 2000s. And by 2009, 2010, it became clear that China's box office was going to be number one in the world. And it was going to be a market too big to ignore and one that you really couldn't politically anger because that would mean shutting off access to all of that revenue. Mm -hmm. And we, God forbid the Hollywood filmmakers do that. But at the same time, they they were suffering back at home uh, in terms of ticket sales and box office and so on. And so they saw this very lucrative market overseas that indeed would become the number one market for them. Um, but it was bigger than that because there are these companies are stacked in a way where they really can't tick off China because it could affect so much more than just their their ticket sales. Can you explain that? Exactly. So over the past 20 years or so, there's been more of a corporatization of Hollywood where studios that once may have been independently owned or even family owned are now smaller pieces in a much bigger corporate pie. And China, through some very high profile examples, made it clear that any infraction that it identifies threatens that entire corporate whole. So this means that when in 1997, Disney makes a movie about the Dalai Lama called Kundin, China isn't mad just about the production of that movie. It's not like they're saying, we're not going to let that movie in. No one even thought that movie was ever going to get into China. They say, no, but that theme park that you're already talking about and all those toys you're talking about selling here, those could be jeopardized by the production of this movie in a subdivision of a subdivision. So you start to see how any comment, anything that will cross a tripwire in China threatens much bigger holdings. And especially mm -hmm. because the studio chiefs are answering to larger corporate interests, they have to worry about much bigger investments than just losing the budget on a single film. You write in the book, there's a saying in Chinese, which roughly translates to kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. The chicken is the person who could be made a public example of. The monkeys are everyone who watched and learned from that person's mistake. Um, like Sony, you said China d threatened the disruption of the electronic supply chain uh, that would cost billions to rebuild if they released a movie that that China didn't like, that didn't make China look the way China wants to look. Right. That was also back in 1997. You might remember the uh, the Brad Pitt movie, Seven Years in Tibet. Oh, that was it, when it was years. released. Um, Sony really had to do a, quite a behind the scenes charm offensive to get back in China's good graces and preserve that supply chain you just mentioned. And, and the chicken monkeys dialectic, I think, explains a lot. So so whenever you see a Western celebrity or a Western company hurrying up and apologizing to Chinese authorities, whether it's because a map on their website recognizes Taiwan or there's some kind of border dispute that is that Chinese authorities think that this person is mischaracterized. Oftentimes you can think about that person as the chicken who is, you know, teaching the other monkeys because these public examples kind of teach everyone a lesson. And really what I think is fascinating is all the better if the offense, I'll say, quote unquote, the offense doesn't seem like that big of a deal at all, because then it lowers everyone's tolerance for risk. Mm. And then they start to self-censor, which is even better than having China have to do it explicitly. And that leads us, of course, to John Cena, who was promoting last year's May of 2021, one of the Fast and Furious movies. And um, he said, I think that Taiwan is a country, right? That he said that was, if I'm not mistaken, that's what he said. That's right. And mm -hmm. man, did the hammer drop on him. Just for fun, we're going to play his little apology. It's, is, it's actually in Mandarin, right? It's, it's in Chinese. Yes, so let's, right. okay, listen, listen. Just to, just to All right, you get the you get the picture. There he is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Self-flagellating. Boy, I really stepped in it. And I mean, most people back here threw up a little in their mouths watching him do this. Now, actually, having read your book, I have more a little bit more empathy for the guy because it's like. <laughs> He, he was made to. I mean, they there is there was no way he was going to get away with that. You're absolutely right. And it wouldn't have been that much of a surprise if we saw the next six John Cena films never play in China. And, and not only that, but that the studios affiliated with those movies start to see larger corporate interests 
threatened in the country as well. And, and you're right, when I was reporting the book, I, I started to realize that, no, John Cena is not the first to run into this problem. It's happened many, many times. And now, actually, in fact, when uh, Hollywood actors and actresses go to China, they're often sent with binders of what comments they are allowed to make. If certain topics come up, these are the, the this is the wording or phrasing to avoid. Really, they've been trying to train actors and actresses to avoid just that problem. Oh, my gosh. All right. But enter Richard Gere, who's basically middle finger up saying, I don't care. I, and to his credit, you know, I mean, I, he's like, I'm an American. I'm going to make the films that I want to make and I'm going to take a stance. We have a clip of him. He was what was he testifying before Congress? I think we have right. um, taken a stand on this um, before a Senate committee. OK, let's just listen to him. I'm not allowed to go to China. Mm. I don't even know now if I'd be allowed in Hong Kong. Um I asked point blank to very well-known actress, friends of mine, Chinese actresses, if I could work with them. And they said, absolutely not. Their Mm -hmm. careers would be over in China. They'd never be allowed to work again. I've had other circumstances with very talented Chinese directors that uh, one was in tears with me, having to call me up and say that he couldn't work with me, that his career would be over and his family could not travel. Um, so, I mean, this is personal to a lot of people. Mm. So what was his original sin in the eyes of the Chinese? It starts in the 90s as well. I mean, actually, it's it's interesting. He, starting in the early 90s, really became the Dalai Lama's number one cheerleader in Hollywood and spoke out repeatedly about human rights abuses in Tibet and China's treatment of Tibetans, even interrupting an Oscar ceremony before that was cool um, back in back in the <laughs> early 90s to talk about it. And um, he started in a movie um, in 1997 called uh, Red Corner about China's legal system certainly didn't make the country look good. And, you know, but things hummed along for a while and he was able to kind of balance that advocacy with his stardom. But then as China's box office started to grow at a clip, it was growing, I mean, 15, 20, 25 percent a year. He became radioactive to a lot of studios because casting such a public supporter of the Dalai Lama might mean your movie doesn't get released there. And at the very least, it just might create more noise than you want to generate and more questions and uncertainty than you want to have. So the last major studio movie that he made was in 2009. And when I started out reporting this book, I wanted to figure out if what he just said was true. Is it true that he has been blacklisted because of his public stance? on Tibet and against China. And, you know, everyone here in Hollywood, they can be really nice and generous, uh, Megan. And so some people said, oh, no, 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 that that's crap. He's he's difficult to work with. Or, you know, I remember one person said he was he was getting John Travolta's sloppy seconds anyway. So some people kind of disputed that he he's had this this consequence laid upon him. But it turns out uh, my reporting shows that it is true. I I spoke to an executive at Warner Brothers who said, you know, it wasn't like a memo went around saying don't hire Richard Gere. But the thought just became, if you can get someone else, just get someone else, because why take on that problem? And so if you really need Richard Gere to star in this role, let's have a conversation. But if you can call Michael Douglas, you can call Gary Oldman, you know, let's get them on the line. It really makes me want to do a crowdsource funding thing to get Richard Gere more movies right now so that we stand behind Americans who have the guts to speak out about these abuses. Right. I mean, there's a reason that they go on for so long because the international community has turned the other cheek. They they have decided we don't care about the genocide going on in China right now with respect to the Uyghurs or any of these other abuses that they've committed. And and the blackballing, as you point out, okay, so maybe it's not express, but isn't it true that Brad Pitt cannot work in China? Like you you forget. I mean, he's like next level. He's past Richard Gere on the band list. You know, it's it's interesting. It's it's always hard to say because really you just have to essentially see what Chinese authorities do, what movies they let in, what movies they don't let in, and see if if uh, a de facto ban has been lifted. I mean, Brad Pitt, um, that was back in the 90s. And, you know, it's interesting, the, the, the juxtaposition of the two, because Brad Pitt's movie, Seven Years in Tibet, came out the same year as Richard Gere's much more critical movie, Red Corner. And while Richard Gere was giving interviews far and wide, talking about why he thought it was so politically important to take a stand, 
Brad Pitt was trying to run in the other direction and say, you know, I, I'm just an actor. Who cares what I think? You know, why, why, don't don't bring me into this. And nonetheless, it took, I think, 15 years before he went back to China. He went with uh, Angelina Jolie when they were married and she was promoting a film. Um, and since then, it's I have to say it's it's probably for his career been a little touch and go. Now he's making the kinds of movies that aren't necessarily going to get into China anyway. I guess the question would become, you know, if he wanted to star in one of the big superhero movies, would this kind of rear its head again? Because over the past year, especially we've seen Chinese uh, critics of, of Westerners really ramp up and it seems like no comment or, you know, history against the China is too distant to be to be rehashed, mm -hmm, to be punished. Can you speak a little bit about the business model of Hollywood right now? Because you expose that too. about there, you know, as a as a woman who grew up in the 80s and 90s, I look back and I think, you know, where where are the fun rom coms? Where are like <laughs> the fun little things that we grew up with? We're like the John Hughes type things. And it's all it's all franchises, series, you know, superheroes, which is great if you're an 18 year old boy, but I'm not. And <laughs> there is a I just thought they they didn't sell here. So it was like, oh, I guess people have different tastes now. It's actually more layered than that. The Hollywood studios have basically sold out and now all they care about is generating big box office. Like they, the art piece of it is kind of gone. You know, I have to say, I don't know if this is any consolation, but you sound a lot like the studio executives here in Hollywood. A oh, lot of it's them not a consolation. Asking, <laughs> yes, I think, I know, like, there, a lot of them are asking the same questions, though, which is where are the rom-coms? Where are the movies that we grew up with? Where, where are the movies that made us fall in love with Hollywood? And, and the fact is that they're just not good business anymore. I mean, if you were running one of these studios, I mean, per our earlier point, you're really running a corporate animal and you have to make sure that you are sort of giving up offerings to the to the corporate gods and increasingly that means making the biggest possible movies that not only sell ticket sales around the world i.e in china but also sell toys can you know service theme park attractions can generate sequel Ugh. sequels and prequels and spin-offs i mean this is the playbook that's been established and really the one that everyone has to follow. Now, I will say, I think there's probably some uh, refuge to be found in the the rise of streaming. We've seen that mm -hmm. introduce different kinds of movies. Well, you got me excited about Netflix and then you dashed my hopes about Netflix with the stuff about Saudi Arabia. So tell us about Netflix and how they've avoided the China problem. Dude, I guess, I mean, this this book sounds like it was a real emotional roller coaster for you. It I was just say. so illuminating. It just explains so many things that you kind of know at a gut level, but you haven't necessarily, at least I hadn't, taken the time to really understand, you know, how we got to, to this point. I appreciate I appreciate that. And you're right about you're right about Netflix, because Netflix several years ago tried desperately to get into China. Um, the, the list of countries that China or I'm sorry, that Netflix isn't in is really quite small and, and illuminating. It includes China, North Korea, Syria. I mean, it is a real uh, a real crew there. And, and China said we don't want Netflix to come in because we have our own streaming services and we want to have some protectionist measures in place to preserve their business. And after Netflix pretty much figured out that it was it was a lost cause, it was not going to get into China, it did give filmmakers and producers there a little bit more license. And so that's why of the few movies or documentaries that have come out in the past couple of years that present more of an unvarnished look at China or have plot details that Chinese authorities would not appreciate, they are often on Netflix because they don't have to have that same consideration that a studio like Universal or Paramount does. And because they don't have a revenue stream up upstream from them. They're not like Sony with an electronics arm that can be punished. Exact, exactly right. Exactly right. Now, so you're right. So while Netflix has in a number of high profile cases censored content for countries where it is operating, China, just by virtue of the country not letting it in, is not one of them. Mm -hmm. So walk us through some of the censorship that China does now uh, with respect to American movies that appear in China. There's sort of that piece. They change our movies. And then with respect to their own movies, it's it reminded me the way you wrote about it, the way we used to portray every Russian back in the Cold War or every, you know, sort of Muslim country right after 9-11. You know, we sort of pick the groups that we want to 
have appear as the bad guy or the enemy. They're doing that to us right now. But start on what they're doing to our movies. Exactly right. And I think it's over the past decade or so, it only takes a couple high profile examples for everyone to to learn what will fly and what won't in China. And and the, the first thing to understand is that before an American movie is released into Chinese theaters, it has to pass approval from Chinese censors. And they're looking for things big and small. So it can be something very cosmetic. Like there was a scene in Mission Impossible 3 that was filmed in Shanghai and it featured laundry drying outside of apartment buildings, which is a very common sight in Shanghai. But China didn't like the idea of audiences around the world seeing an image of their country that looked more bl- more backwards than they would have liked. So they asked the studio to edit it out. But then there are also deeper, more thematic issues with some movies. There's an example of um, um, a sequel to Men in Black being released. And, and I don't know if you remember, but in that movie, anytime a civilian sees one of the uh, the secret aliens, there's a memory wiping they device that memory. the agents yeah. can use to essentially scrub their their brains of what they just saw. And China Chinese authorities didn't like that plot detail too much because it just seemed too much um, a metaphor that hit too close to home in a country that controls the media and the narrative as the communist party does so it, it ranges from the cosmetic to the thematic but you're absolutely right that if you go to the movies in china which i, I try i would try to do every time i was over there i try to just go see a movie and it really does remind you quite a bit of those 1980s rah-rah movies about the evil Soviets. I mean, really black and white, any portrayal of an American is often a pretty uh, a pretty negative one. I, I met a young guy who um, moved over to, to China and students started getting cast in some of these movies. And he said, you know, he said it with a laugh, but he was like, you know, I'm typecast all the time. I'm either an American soldier who gets shot or an evil businessman, or the guy who's trying to steal the girl from the hero. I mean, it's not, there's not really a lot of uh, flexibility there. And, and what's fascinating is, especially after um, COVID, when tensions between the U.S. and China really rose, we started to see a bunch of movies about the Korean War rushed into production. And so right now, some of the biggest Chinese blockbusters in China today have been Chinese movies that are about Chinese victories over American troops. So while Hollywood has had to scrub its product of Chinese villains, China's been casting America as the villain time and time again. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to squeeze in a break. After this break, we're going to talk about why the Chinese communist leadership apparently loved Titanic and managed to change uh, Top Gun. Okay, so stand by for that because uh, there's a remake of Top Gun that they were involved in. More with Eric right after this. So, Eric, um, the apparently is it President Xi who, who likes Titanic? It was his predecessor um, okay. back in the uh, in the late 90s. Um, Titanic. I mean, this was this was a fascinating story to 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 revisit um, when when Fox released Titanic. Obviously, this worldwide global phenomenon. China's box office was still relatively small, but this was its first real breakout hit. And what was so fascinating was that the Chinese leadership, the leadership of the Communist Party actually encouraged party members to go see the film and there were several reasons why one of which was they thought it was a very good uh commentary on on class issues right because of the lifeboat situation and and all Mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. but there also was a speech given by by the leader of the party saying we have to go see this so that we can sort of understand just how you can emotionally move people through art like this there was it was one of the first real moments we see chinese leaders understand the power, the soft power, frankly, that narrative and spectacle and the movies can provide. And I think it's one reason why Chinese influence on Hollywood hits Americans a little different than Chinese influence on tech or aerospace or some other industry. It's because over the past hundred years or so, we've really treated these films and these companies like hearts and minds factories. And, and we've come to expect them to sell America to the world like a movie like Titanic did. Yeah. And you, I know you wrote that they particularly liked the scene with the uh, musicians staying on the deck of the Titanic as it went down. 
I mean, who, I mean, who, do, who doesn't, right? It's just, <laughs> right. It's, it was but on it means TV something different. Day, actually. I think it meant something yeah. different to them. It meant some, it meant something different. It meant something different. You're right. But we, we see that actually throughout, throughout history sometimes where, where an American movie just kind of hits a little differently in China because of some kind of cultural reasons. And, and you're absolutely right that in Titanic, the, uh, the bandmates who were sort of doing their job and, and sort of fulfilling their duty, even as the ship sinks, they were held up as heroes among the communist party members. It's all about subjugation of the self and, and, performing for the for the you know masses the better of the masses so what happened with top gun because i know you say if you just if you sort of look at what happened with top gun and and then the remake of top gun it gives you a good insight into china's growing power yeah i think it's i think it's an appropriate bookend because here you have the original top gun released in 1984 really just like the perfect emblem of reaganism on screen enlistments in the armed services jump after the movie comes out. I mean, the movie does a better job of getting people to enlist than traditional enlistment campaigns do. And I mean, like who's ever looked cooler on screen than Tom Cruise flying those jets. Right. So when Paramount decides they're going to reboot the film many, many years later in 2018, they start to release some marketing materials for this new film. And the marketing materials show just how much has changed to the economics of Hollywood in the 30 years between the two films. Because you might remember that in the original film, Tom Cruise has got his he's got his sunglasses and he's got that bomber jacket that has the patches on the back that symbolize the tour of the USS Galveston. And there is a Taiwanese flag and there's also a Japanese flag um, among the patches on his back. And when the new movie was made and the new poster was released, those two flags were gone. And the reason why was because of China's influence over the film industry, because a Taiwanese flag, you know, to our earlier conversation is a is um, a reminder of territorial issues and and a bit of a challenge to the one China policy that Beijing wants to enforce and tensions between China and Japan have been last have lasted for for several decades. So Chinese financiers on the new Top Gun pointed out that this might be a problem or it might just be something to avoid a risk not worth taking. And so before Chinese authorities could even say a word, Paramount removed those two patches from the jacket of the new film. And there just is something so deeply ironic about this happening to a movie as American and as sort of distinctly American as Top Gun, as as a change coming to a character named Maverick, of all things. Oh my God, we're such Um, bootlickers now. We're bootlickers. Well, I mean, I think think what it, and and, and then the, the ultimate irony is that doing this doesn't necessarily guarantee the movie will, be released in China. It's still possible that Chinese authorities decide they don't want their audiences to see a movie that valorizes the U.S. military to such a degree. So it might have all been for naught. Oh, OK. Tell us what happened with the movie Red Dawn, because this is this was one of the big films when I came of age. Patrick Swayze, Charlie Sheen. And when you were first saying it was problematic, I was like, I don't get it. That was about that was about the Soviets, right? I mean, like that wasn't about the Chinese. So what was the problem they had with Red Dawn? It was it was a similar situation to Top Gun when they remade Red Dawn in 2009. MGM thought, you know, just as you said, it has a lot of fans who grew up with the original film. So they said, let's remake it. And they said, well, you know, a Russian invasion of the U.S. doesn't make a lot of sense. So why don't we do China? Why don't we make it a Chinese invasion? So they write the script. They film the movie. And it's very similar to the 1980s version, where instead, this time we have Chinese paratroopers landing on the front lawn. And then someone didn't get the memo. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But they eventually did because China made it clear that this could be a problem. And this is a problem for MGM for a number of reasons, one of which is MGM releases James Bond movies and they release a lot of big budget features that rely on the Chinese box office. And those releases might be jeopardized if this Chinese version of Red Dawn was released. So MGM did something extraordinary. This is back in 2011. They send the movie, the completed movie, to a secret visual effects company here in Burbank. And they pay them a million dollars to go in and frame by frame, remove every Chinese flag every line of dialogue referencing China and replace it with North Korea. 
And the movie is released as a Red Dawn remake about a North Korean invasion of the U.S. And the screenwriters on this film were not happy. Uh, As one of them pointed out, this is the most ridiculous thing he had ever heard in his life. It's, I mean, we can have issues with the plausibility of the original Red Dawn. A North Korean version of Red Dawn makes even less sense. And audiences also rejected the idea outright. But what was fascinating to me is when I went back and I did research on this, I didn't find there to be a lot of outrage or consternation. People knew that MGM had done this before the new movie came out, but there really wasn't a lot of backlash. And I think it was probably because relations between the U.S. and China were at a different point than they are Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, though, is that the movie did come up back in 2018 or 2019 Um, Trump administration officials would cite that as one of the examples of, in their eyes, how Hollywood had helped fuel and support China's rise. Yeah, uh, you point out in the book, uh, Trump, uh, William Barr, our old AG, uh, Pompeo, they all pointed to this movie as evidence of something else, but consciousness about China and its problematic nature and its relationship with us and that weirdness is rising, a point you get to, and and I want to get to with you in one second. But first, a couple more movies that I, I think are They'd help tell the story. Transformers kind of went a different way. It wasn't about scrubbing scenes from Transformers. Tell us what that movie did that shows China's power. So this was this is um, this is one of the movies that that you reference is, is all you see. It's one of those big budget franchise titles. And Transformers, this is the fourth film in the series. It's a it's a film called Age of Extinction. It was coming out in 2014. And this is really the heyday of Hollywood chasing Chinese money because the box office is growing and the U.S. box office is flatlining. And so Transformers became this case study and how how much can you try to appeal to Chinese audiences in a single American movie while keeping it Amer- in an American movie? So there are Chinese actors and actresses in it. There are scenes filmed in China. There is product placement up the wazoo. I mean, there is a scene where Mark Wahlberg is using Chinese protein powder in the middle of Chicago. There's another scene where a character has to use an ATM in the middle of Texas. It turns out to be a Chinese ATM. I mean, really some illogical choices in this film. But what was fascinating is that there was one scene that the Chinese authorities specifically requested and that ended up in the final product. And it's a scene at the end. It's one of the classic, like, you know, third act, whole cities being destroyed. And the city being destroyed is Hong Kong. And in the original script, Mark Wahlberg and the American heroes arrive to help save the day. And the Chinese authorities said, you know, it would be better if Beijing came to the rescue first. Oh, my gosh. And the executives working on the film thought, well, it's probably not something that a lot of audiences are even going to clock. And the fighter jets in Beijing would be closer than those in the U.S., so it might make sense. And so in the final version of the film, you can still see this today, there is a, a scene of Hong Kong being destroyed, and then there's a rather random cut to a Chinese defense minister who says, we will defend Hong Kong at all costs. And this was in 2014. And when I caught up to people who worked on the film from Hong Kong many years later, they said, you know, in retrospect, it feels like it was one of the first signs we had of how China was going to exert a heavier hand over Hong Kong and really try to cast itself as Hong Kong's benefactor, protector, you know, overseer. Mm -hmm. And And they were complicit. This isn't a a Hollywood movie starring Mark Wahlberg and robot guns. Yeah. And they were complicit. Instead of being the America we've always known and loved that stands up to bullies, we we bowed. We bowed over and over these Hollywood companies over and over and over for the reasons we're discussing. Is the is the box office now officially bigger in China for most movies made in America than it is here in the States? It is. But COVID had a lot to do with that because theaters in China reopened far faster than they did in the U.S. So even though we expected the Chinese box office to eventually become number one in the world, COVID accelerated it by probably three or four years. Okay, so I guess it's not a huge surprise. But can you can we talk for a minute about Kung Fu Panda? I mean, Mm. my kids love that movie, Jack Black, right? He, He does the voice. What what's the deal with Kung Fu Panda? 
This was another, this was a sort of another turning point in the relationship between China and the U.S. because it came out in 2008, which is the year of the Beijing Olympics, uh, a really fascinating moment to look back on because I think it was a moment of optimism and potential, um, you know, more cooperation between China and the U.S. And DreamWorks Animation releases this movie, Kung Fu Panda, that really had been conceived of almost not by accident, but in that kind of random way that stories come together. They thought it would be funny to combine Kung Fu with pandas. And they released this film and it's this global hit. And it really prompts some existential soul searching among Chinese authorities because they say, wait, why did an American company take our national mascot and our national tradition and make this global soft power tool, turn it into this kind of cuddly hero for kids and families? Why didn't we do that? Why didn't our filmmakers do that? And we started to see this fascinating. It was one of the first realizations that I think Chinese leaders had that whenever you're making movies and you're trying to use movies to win people over to your cause, it can't feel like medicine and it can't feel like propaganda, that the most effective propaganda doesn't feel like propaganda at all. And so they started asking officials from DreamWorks Animation, they would have them come to China and say, you know, how did you do that? Why did you decide to make his father a duck? Was that a commentary? Were you, were you trying to make a message here? And and I think it's it was one of the first realizations that a lot of people in Hollywood had that China was still approaching cinema as a primarily or purely messaging tool that it actually also could be entertaining and sometimes if it were entertaining it could be even more effective and i think over the next decade or so what we saw was china learn how to do that as i say it's they learned how to put the pill in the peanut butter i have a golden retriever that's what we yeah. have to do when he has medicine yeah. you put the medicine inside something that kind of helps it go down a little bit more easily and that's what a lot of the more recent chinese movies have managed to do mm. and it's not just Hollywood. I mean, you point out the book, there's something that I don't know if Hollywood was the, was the canary in the coal mine, but it was certainly one of many industries and sort of areas in the United States that would eventually succumb to Chinese influence or go seeking Chinese influence. Can you put it in the broader perspective? Yeah, I think I think in many ways it was an early student. It's funny, though, I, I, I said that to someone who worked in Hollywood and, and worked or tried to work with China a few times, and he used the same analogy you did. He said, no, it was more a canary in the coal mine. But at the very least, I think this happened quite a bit with um, with the NBA, when the NBA had its own issues of sort of seeing an economic backlash to political problems with with Chinese authorities or taking a stance that China didn't like. Really what the NBA was doing was learning the lessons that Hollywood had several years later. And I think every time you see a company, whether it's Intel or H&M or Tesla, have to thread the needle between maintaining that access but not incurring the wrath of critics here at home, they're really trying to sort of follow a playbook that Hollywood had to learn, you know, 20, 15 years ago. You've got brand new reporting in the book, breaking news on companies like Apple with, with respect to deals that they struck, like Tim Cook, that we didn't know about that help put their relationship in perspective. I mean, they Apple, obviously, very beholden to China and is in no position to lecture anybody on the protection of human rights. It's We've been talking about it lately because all these sort of folks who want to see Joe Rogan kicked off of Spotify is saying, like, go over to Apple. It's like... Uh, read this book. Apple's got some problems too. Well, Apple is Apple's an interesting case because they, I mean, they've been moving into Hollywood quite aggressively um, with movies and TV shows. And I think sometimes whenever we talk about these studios being so beholden to maintaining access to the Chinese market, sometimes people say, well, you know what, these tech giants, they, they've got more money than God. They don't have to care about that. Well, it turns out it depends on the tech company because Apple has not only a deep customer base in China, they sell millions of iPhones in China, but they also have a supply chain that can't be disrupted as well. So as we see Apple move in to Hollywood, their, their executives have been quoted as saying, look, the one, the two things we're not going to do are hardcore nudity and anything that crosses China. Mm. Wow. And and by the way, you point out in the book that after Red Dawn and the censorship of that, right, to make it uh, North Korea, the invaders, that that no, I want to get my note, no major studio release 
had cast Chinese characters as villains since then, and no major studio release portrayed China's government as a bad actor. I mean, truly, it's it's when the bully gets in your own head that he's really one. I think I I think that that um you know that detail there about Red Dawn that came out in 2012, so it's been a decade. I mean, I think it gets all the more glaring as you, the U.S. China relationship becomes the clear story of the 21st century. It is it is a story that I think we haven't been able to explore in all its complexity. And I mean more than just casting, you know, China as the villain. I think that it's it's flattened a lot of Americans' understanding of China in general because studios are either afraid to touch something they think is too sensitive or really they've been blocked from portraying China with any nuance or complexity. All right, let's talk about how you know, Hillary Clinton ran against Donald Trump in 2016 for the presidency. Trump won. You write in the book that her husband's presidency was a time that may have laid the foundation in some ways for people like the Teamsters and so on to wind up voting for Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. It's a fascinating story and connection. Explain what you're talking about. Yeah, I was fascinated by this as well. This was back in the 90s. The Clinton administration really was the, was the um the spearhead of getting China to join the WTO. And it's what allowed China to really see the economic rise that we've had over the past two decades. And what was fascinating was at the time, because I had to go back and read all these articles that were written at the time, and there were stories of of union members and really influential Democrats saying this is going to destroy our base. This is going to lead to job losses that really turn Democrats against the party. Um, and sure enough, in 2016, as you said, counties that had lost more jobs to China because of that deal were more likely to have voted for Trump. So you're right. So it is one of the um, one of the interesting things we see sort of like just when you go back and you look at history and sort of unintended consequences, you know, Bill Clinton's support for the WT for China's entry into the WTO, which then was um, moved through under George W. Bush, was seen at the time as one of the best ways to bring Chinese China to reform. You know, there was there were there were speeches that that Bill Clinton would give in which he said, you know, if we open up China's economy, if we allow the internet in, it's only a matter of time before democracy and reform will follow. And that has proven to be not the case. In fact, it's there have been several steps backwards in that mm-hmm. respect. It's in gone the other way. Then. Exactly. <laughs> Anything has gone the other way. Right, right. And then at the same time, um, you know, the decision seems to have really cost the Democrats some of the core constituencies that they'd relied on reliably for several election cycles. Mm -hmm. I know we all sort of laughed a little with Trump with China, China, China. He was onto something and he was so disciplined in his message. That's the that's the craziness of Trump, right? It's like you he's he's smart and he's wily. And there was a reason he kept saying China. He understood that sort of white working class that makes up the Teamsters and so on in a way that Hillary did not. And she should have. And boy, oh, boy, did it cost her. Um, You do get to the sort of present day realities, though. In 2022, um, as we're seeing now with the record low ratings uh, with the Olympics in Beijing, Mm -hmm. Americans are waking up to China's serious problems and to the problems with our having received so much of their culture and embraced it and gone with it and let them, you know, we've we've let them buy up so much land and so, so much of our industry and, you know, from pigs and meat and so on like their their power grows daily here and americans i think are starting to see this is this is problematic so how have things changed and how does that affect do you think hollywood well hollywood is really had a very weird six months with china because starting last year several major movies that traditionally would have had no problem getting into chinese theaters like black widow the eternals the new spider-man None of them were accepted into Chinese theaters, and it's left a big fat zero on the balance sheets of studios that were expecting releases there. Mm -hmm. And no one really knows why. There are theories, but there's no answer. No one gets a memo from Beijing saying this is why we're not accepting your movie. And it's really led to a lot of consternation here in Hollywood because 
it looks like we now have more uncertainty than ever in a business plan that has been essentially calcified over the last 20 years. A business plan that's come to expect those Chinese grosses has been thrown out the window and it could change tomorrow. China could just start letting movies in again, but it's a degree of uncertainty that I think has bred quite a bit of resentment here in Hollywood and even a sense that the industry may have gotten played that over the past uh, 20 years. Uh, well, I mean, it's, and it's something that I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that other industries have said, you know, they experience too. You run in, you rush toward, you rush toward Chinese access. And then whenever the wall goes back up, there's little recourse or nothing you can do. And that seems to be a moment that Hollywood is in right now. And, and I'm, it'll be, I'll be curious to see what people do, because like I said, this really disrupts the way that Hollywood has thought it will be doing business for the next foreseeable future. Mm. And you see, you know, what's happening with the Olympics right now, the press intimidation. You're probably not surprised to see any of those stories come out. I mean, that's just a smaller scale example of what they've done without us necessarily noticing uh, in the films we watch and the entertainment we seek for decades now. No, I think I think you're right. I mean, the, the the Olympics, the experience of seeing the Olympics right now has been fascinating because it is such a bookend to the 2008 games. Right. In 2008, George W. Bush attended the opening ceremony. Here we are 14 years later in the middle of a diplomatic boycott. And, and I do think that it's I think NBC and others covering the games knew going into it that there would have to be some conversation around the human rights abuses the issues of free expression in China, and that it really does feel like, at least from the American perspective, like this has been part of the conversation. I'm curious to see, though, how it's playing in China, because I think within China, oftentimes party leaders want the Olympics, not just necessarily because of some kind of victory on the world stage, but to bolster support internally as well, and Mm -hmm. to signal to the Chinese people that this is their moment. This is their moment in history. And I would hear that time and time again when I went to China, when people would say, you know, back in the 80s, when you talk about this Hollywood heyday, that was America's time. But now it's China's time. And why shouldn't we have our own heroes? Why shouldn't we have our own blockbusters? And why shouldn't we be able to show our movies around the world like you did? And I think I think so. Sometimes I think the Olympics, even if it looks like it's taking a reputational cost here in America or other countries that are willing to have these conversations and explore China in those kind of darker and more complex ways. I think sometimes in China, though, it might not matter as much. And there actually might be the reverse effect of mm. bolstering support and bolstering. Patriotism. It's not China's time. It's not. Uh, I mean, they're, they're very good at propaganda, uh, less so at actual economic rewards in this communist country. I will say this. You know, Ben Shapiro was on yesterday of The Daily Wire talking about this movie that they just put out. It's on YouTube today. It's called Shut In. It's really good. It's a thriller. And I was saying it's really important to support them because they are independent and they're not woke and they're not controlled by sort of far left people on, on in Hollywood. They're not controlled by China either. And if we don't start supporting companies that aren't controlled by them, uh, we deserve what we get. Eric, you're brilliant. I love the book. It's called Red Carpet and it's out right now. Highly recommended to everybody. Thank you for being here. Hey, it was my pleasure. Thank you, Megan. Tomorrow on the show, we've got Dave Smith. Fascinating guy, comedian, libertarian, and possible candidate for president. Download the show in the meantime, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.